Who what is up, everybody? Welcome into Chris and Company, episode 13. I am Chris Castellani, the beginning of a new age. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that in the intro here because we have a very, very special guest who is joining us, an interview that I just recorded with Detroit Tigers manager, AJ Hinch. Uh, very excited about this. Just got done uh, with the interview. He was cordial. He was kind enough to stay longer than than I expected him to, which was great. Uh, just a quick heads up. In the first few minutes, you were, you will hear a few dings as his phone was was going off. I uh, appreciated him. After a minute, uh, we, we got down to the bottom of that and, and turned off the notifications. So the last... 55 minutes of a one hour interview is, is spotless after that. And uh, you guys are going to really enjoy this one. Just, I mean, it's what I expect. Just a sharp, sharp guy. I don't want to get your expectations too high, but before we jump into it, make sure you hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can follow me on Twitter at Castellani 2014, all Chris and company content you can find down below in the description for this video. All right. I don't want to waste any more of your time. Let's get to our interview with Detroit Tigers manager, AJ Hinch. Chris and Company, episode 13. Very special guest. For this one, we are joined by world champion uh, and Olympian, which I'm going to ask about in, in a little bit, um, and Detroit Tigers manager, AJ Hinch. AJ, welcome to the program, man. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks for asking. Yeah, no problem. Well, no, it's, it's a pleasure's mine. Obviously, lots of excitement this week with with the season starting off i know you guys just left uh left lakeland uh i guess just a little vibe check how, how are you feeling right now i mean compared i guess how are you feeling compared to previous seasons uh well first off we we are we are in a good place um i think we're heading in the right direction we know kind of task at hand what we need to do um it's been a good camp we we we, we got to the end of camp as healthy as we possibly could um, some tough decisions at the end, but like good teams have that. So we're trending towards being a good team. Now I'm the guy that's paid to like, make sure these guys know we have to go do it instead of talk about it. We, we can have these aspirations, but we have a lot of things we got to get better at. Um, but it's a healthy organization. We're in a good place competitively. Our heads are good. Um, our health is good. We, we, we just got a lot of work to do and a lot of games to play, but man, I, it's a good time to be a tiger. Fantastic. And I was I was going to save this question for later, but I'm always curious as a manager, how much stock do you put into spring training performance? Because I've, I've been watching games long enough to know I've seen guys have monster springs who end up having subpar campaigns. I've seen guys who really struggled in the spring who had who ended up having great seasons. Obviously, a few years ago, Badu, he kept it going the first week and your first couple months into that 2021 campaign. Uh, how much of it is do you take out of it and how much of it is more of a player by player basis? little bit player by player, you know, as a player myself, I wanted it to matter the most because if I had a good spring, I want to be rewarded. If I have a bad spring, then I understand like decisions that are made. So like we take it as players, like just like the season, like I get good and bad. As a manager, you know, you look at it a little bit differently where we can conveniently pick and choose what, what we want to value out of spring. Now is, is it how we're doing it? Is it why we're doing it? You want to send guys up and say, you know, hey, we want you to work on this or we want you to see pitches hit with two strikes. And now we're putting like the stack in the deck against them and like we're making them do things that are uncomfortable that they wouldn't normally do during the season. Well, that performance, we don't we don't hold against them as much when you're in a competition. The competition, the, the performance is like magnified and you start seeing why guys are doing what they're doing. But it's not about scoreboard stats. It's about a lot of other things that come into play. And, you know, we're not great at this industry at, at articulating that or telling people like it's important for you, but not for you. It's you can throw 98 and get sent down. You can give up homers and, and make the team like it. It's it's sort of an unfair six weeks of performance because we can we can bring track record into it. We can bring what you did in 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 the last season. Um, we, we kind of pile it all into one big conversation and ultimately take the team north that we feel like best suited for those first few weeks to get off to a good start. 
Does it ever become difficult to maybe not buy into the hype of guys who get off to who have crazy good springs the way that Akil did several years ago? Yeah, it's hard because you got to see why they're doing it and who they're doing it against and and what the elements are. I mean, you you should never penalize players for performance. Like that's the name of the game. Like that's what you do. You you go out, you ask them to compete. You got to you got to get a good pitch to hit. You got to put the ball in play. You got to find find holes and find hits and and do damage. Um, but it's not the big leagues. Like it's not the same. And I think sometimes whether it's the media, whether it's me, whether it's the players, whether it's the coaches, like you can get wrapped up into the in treating it like the season and have a emotional reaction one way or the other, and, and it's counterproductive, right? Like I've seen guys go off in spring, and then and then we show up in the in a big stadium in the third deck, and the pressure counts, and the scoreboard matters, and it just deflates because you no longer see the wide range of pitching as a hitter, or you no longer are facing like good hitter, good hitter, aspiring hitter, maybe less than aspiring hitter, and then a good hitter. Like, it's just so different than the regular season. But we cover it. We talk about it. We we pretend like these are exhibition games when in reality they're just practice games that, yeah. that have so much context that we lose during spring. Uh, yeah, I brought up earlier, you know, I like to do some of a deep dive into my guests. And uh, you, I saw, you know, when when looking through your story, you were a member of the 96 uh, Olympics team, uh, bronze medalist. Kind of talk me through that experience. That must have been interesting playing you. I know that one was in Atlanta, I believe, at the time. So kind of talk. Yeah, about it that. was home country, Atlanta. We were in college. We were the last amateur team to play in the Olympics um, in 96. In 2000, they took they took minor league players and a, and a couple of guys on 40 man and then um, you know, baseball has been hit or miss in the Olympics ever since. So I, I, I love the fact that I, I played for Team USA my whole life since when I was, you know, 14, 15, junior Team USA, all the way through college. Um, at one point, I think I had the most games played in all of Team USA in baseball. And that it meant the world to me to play in front of um, our home country to play. You know, we walked into opening ceremonies and there's the dream team and there's all these famous names and the gymnasts and the swimmers and and then we played a tournament in a big league stadium, um, Old Fulton County Stadium, where the Braves played and, and um, advanced all the way to the to the to the the bronze medal. We got beat by Japan in the semifinals. We we won the bronze medal game against Nicaragua, and now I have this medal that I got to share with my kids. And I've got their classrooms. And when the Olympics would come around, my kids would always ask me, "Hey, come up and 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 you know bring the medal." Like people love it, you know, mm -hmm. and I use it. Um, I have it displayed in my house and, and it's something that I'm super proud of uh, because wearing Team USA across my chest, I have a great picture of a sold out Fulton County Stadium with me up to bat, my name, my number, you know, just um, later I got to tell the story to Yuli Gurriel in Houston because I played against his dad in the Olympics, you know, when his dad was, uh, was a big first baseman. Um, and some of the Cuban players that have come over that, that, you know, are, are famous now. So it, it's a life experience. One, just, just being in the Olympic village. Um, my mother and my aunt were at Centennial park when the bomb went off in 96 and like things that, that a life experience to baseball experience. I'm glad that I, you know, delayed turning pro a year to get that experience forever. Call myself an Olympian and a medalist at that. That was 96. When did you make your debut in the bigs? 98 day opening 98. day my major league debut was was uh up against pedro martinez his first start in the american league coming from the montreal expos to the ball so, so that they, they let you off easy then to begin the yeah i mean now i think it was a manager i'm like i'm giving you guys it easy man i had pedro martinez and tom candiotti knuckleballer that i had to catch um, yeah, that, in my major yeah. league debut at the same coliseum that we play at the oakland a's today but mm -hmm. um yeah two years removed from I had one year in minor league baseball before I made my debut and, and uh, it was a quick rise. And then, uh, you know, you bounced around from, from a few teams, found your way to Detroit and the, uh, the infamous 03 team. And I'm just, I'm very curious, you know, cause that team just a, a one uh, didn't, did not tie or break the American league losses record. But I, you know, now that 21 years removed from it, were there any lessons you learned as a player on that team that you carried over at, as a manager now in, in the modern age? Well, I apologize to Tram every spring um, <laughs> on his birthday when, 
Well, he's in camp for his birthday every year. So I always acknowledge birthdays in the room, team meetings every morning. We try to have a little bit of fun in there. And I apologize to him all the time that, man, I was a part of that that team you managed in, in 2003. Um, I started out the year in the minor leagues. Then I, I got up. I got hurt. I came back. We finished the year with like, what, three or four rule, five picks, a lot of journeymen, um, some really notable players. I mean, Bobby Higginson was a nice player in our in our franchise history. Dimitri Young had a really good year that year. Brandon Inch has, has made a huge impact in the Detroit area in general, um, you know, at Michigan. So it, there was a lot, you know, that, that I'm appreciative of. Um, and I think the values instilled by Tram and Gibby and and the, the group of coaches that I had, they never quit. Like they never quit on us. They never turned their back on us. They never disparaged us. And so I, I think taking every game as its own entity and supporting your players and being there, because uh, if they could do that for us in that in that season, I can certainly do it, you know, through this, um, you know, this journey through what, what's been the last few years here and, and even the last decade. I'm entering my 11th year as a manager I never would have thought that I was going to be a manager to begin with, let alone, you know, do it over a decade. Um, but but Tram was a part of it. So I, I make sure and I apologize to him. I, I should apologize to the fans that are watching. I know that was a rough year to watch, um, but we grinded the best we could. It, it all worked out in the end. And look, uh, they I, what you said is correct is that team did finish strong. I mean, they avoided they were five, six in a row to end that end that campaign to uh, we dogpiled the last day, like yeah. they made the playoffs. We were facing Ron Gardenhire's Minnesota Twins, yeah. and they were going to the uh to the playoffs that year. And there were a lot of good names that were in triple A for them at that time. Michael Kadire, Justin Morneau, and Troy Hunter were I think was on that team. Like there was there was a lot of Jock Jones who I played in the Olympics with. Those guys were crushing, and and so we got to play what was the equivalent of the Rochester Red Wings on the last day of the season <laughs> to make sure we didn't lose 120, and that mattered so much. As we poker faced it with the media, we pretended like we didn't matter, but none of us wanted to be a part of of history like that. Of course, and it's only human nature, and you got to do what you got to do to to save face to a certain extent. But I, yeah, it's as a competitive guy, like you just you can't have that in the back. It's going to be in the back of your head when, when you're. No, you've got to hate losing. Yeah, like, when you get to this level, like, yes, you know, the performance matters. And, yes, there's an individual side to professional sports, no matter if it's under a team or whether it's an individual sport. There's there's individualism in everything that we do, but you've got to hate losing if you're going to survive, you know, the journey of a season and and things that matter. To, to We all win. We're all called, we're all called winners. You said it at the beginning of my intro, like, I'm going to be attached to winning. Now, there's – Obviously, we can go into the Astro stuff too, but it it we won in seventeen, we won in eighteen, we won in nineteen, been been to two World Series. People associate you with accomplishment, and so that comes with with uh, with winning. That's a good point. This is your third managerial stint. You managed the Diamondbacks for a little bit, and obviously, very successful tenure in Houston. Now in Detroit, uh, I guess what's the one thing that the AJ Hinch that managed in Arizona didn't know that the AJ Hinch in Detroit has has learned uh great question you know i i um i mean first off i feel like a different person just because of the experience and and i was in my early 30s i had stopped playing at 30 years old and i had gone into the front office and i was the director of player development so ryan garco's job in the tigers organization was my first job post playing and I, I had no interest in going on the field. My wife and I were having kids. We were going to have, build our family. She was from Arizona. This opportunity in Phoenix opened up to be the farm director. And so I was full-fledged, kind of get away from the travel, get away from the field, get into and dive into player development. And then my boss at the time, Josh Burns, pulled me over in lunch and is like, hey, I want you to manage. And at the time, you know, we Bob Melvin was the manager in Arizona. We were we were you know, kind of trending towards being a good team. We had young players that were about to break through. Um, and, and Josh wanted me to manage and I, I couldn't believe it. Like I wasn't, I wasn't really looking down that path. I was, I, you know, I went to Stanford. I, I'd been, um, I'd been a player before. I kind of had aspirations to be a GM, but didn't really know where this career was going to go. Young family. And here he, I thought he wanted me to go to double A. Like I knew he had, he was stressed on some of our minor league development stuff that was going on. And, and I was battling a few managers in the minors on 
not bunning every third at bat or not sitting lefties against lefties and letting these kids play. And um, he goes, no, I'm talking about the big leagues. And I literally almost thought I was going to puke. I'm like, I'm 32, 33 years old. I'm not really ready to manage. So I turned it down. Mm. I said, no, um, it's April. The team had just broke camp. I'm not, it, I thought it was a bad idea. I'd been on teams. I've been on the Kansas city when they fired Tony Muser. I was on the Phillies. Uh, when they fired Larry Boa, uh, and neither of those made like a substantial change in a season. Like maybe at the end of the year, and you make a culture change, and a and a and a, a head coach or manager or whatever it is, you can change directions of your franchise. But in season, man, it's it's rocking and rolling and going. Mm-hmm. So they come to me a couple of weeks later, and they they said, "Listen, our um, basically you're gonna take it, and here's a <laughs> here's a." <laughs> So I, I took it. And um, anyway, long story to tell you, I wish the, the this version of me would just say, just relax, like mm-hmm. just be yourself, be vulnerable. Um, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to make gut calls that are wrong. You're going to make sort of prepared information driven decisions that are wrong uh, because results are really hard to predict in baseball. It's a it's a very random game where you try to build system. You try to you just be yourself. Like, let the players know when you're pissed. Let the players know when, you, um, when you're when you happy, and, and they'll appreciate that. As a young manager, I wanted to look managerial. I wanted to to, mm. to be very stoic. I wanted to – that's what a leader was. That's what the old guy was. And I, I was as young as some of the players. Like, I had Tony Clark, now the union leader, as my first baseman. I had Brandon Webb, Cy Young Award winner, as one of my pitchers. He later got hurt. I had Eric Burns, who I hosted on a recruiting trip at Stanford and played with, with the A's as my left fielder. Like, they didn't want to see, like, the buttoned up, like, stiff guy. They wanted to see, you know, behind the scenes, they want you to lead them. They want you to push them. They want you to coach them. And that that version didn't come out until Houston. And now I'm, you know, it's 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 very natural. And I, I know the public version of me in the dugout. I'm pretty stoic. I'm pretty quiet. Um, I'm not a big chirper, you know, behind the scenes, I'm, a, I'm kind of a nutcase to my players. Like they'll tell you that I'm, you know, that I'm, I'm pretty entrenched in, in the daily operation of what they're doing. So I wish that young version of me would just take a breath and relax and, hmm. and show them that, um, you know, you're in the trenches with them as a, as a, as a teammate. Yes. I'm the, I have the office. I have the title. I have the, I have the, the, you know, the, the power of the pen, um, just be yourself. Um, and a little six degrees of tiger separation, but Gibby took over right after you left yeah. Arizona, right? Yeah, yeah. He was next, he was next in line. Yeah. yeah. Um, did, were you surprised when you got hired by the Astros after 14? So I had interviewed for a couple of jobs. I, so I went from, from Phoenix to San Diego and went back into the front office. Um, and I had ascended to assistant GM and I was in charge of like player personnel and pro scouting and some of the personnel stuff. So, but I always had my eye on managing and I've had a couple of teams that had called me, in, you know, informally and asked me about managing. And then I had a formal interview um, in 13 with the Astros um, that went to Bo Porter. And that job was a lot different in 13 than it was going to be in 15. So when they called me back, um, you know, I, I knew I had a, a serious shot at it. I already had a relationship with Jeff Luno, Jim Crane, the owner. Um, they were making a change and they wanted me to interview again. Um, so I, I, you're always surprised. There's only 30 of these. And everybody in the world thinks they can be this person. Like everybody's a good manager in their own, in their own way, right? Like we all, we all know what the right plays to call in the NFL. We all know what the right, what the, what the right formations are in, in basketball. We all know what moves we should make in baseball. So I, I didn't know where they were headed, um, but I was very appreciative. And I, I went in to get the job. Like I wanted to manage and that, um, that opportunity turned out to be, you know, a, a opportunity of a lifetime. It obviously worked out for the best. I mean, it seems forever ago now, but there was that period in the 2010s, early 2010s, where the Astros were just, they were at the bottom. I mean, you got there right kind of at the beginning of the Ascension were you surprised at how good that 15 team turned out to be? So we we didn't, you know, we talked about winning. That was one thing that I, and it's very similar to, to what's going on in Detroit mm-hmm. right now, is we need to embrace the topic of winning. And we need to embrace the development that needs to happen 
to learn how to win and you've got to bring in guys that have, that have won and have done it before and then it gels together and then you've got to go win games. But you got to talk about it, you know, before you do it, but then you got to go put the work in that it takes. And so that team was was very hungry and that was at the beginning of, of Correa, the beginning of Springer, right in the, you know, at, at the peak of Altuve, he had won the, the, the batting title in 2014. Um, the pitching wasn't quite the same. Um, we were starting to build some pitching, but the position player group, while they were, I guess, rebuilding or struggling or whatever, um, they didn't miss. And here comes Bregman, here comes Tucker. Like they hit on so many high end draft picks um, that it became, it kind of came fast for this group. We hadn't won in Houston in 10 years um, when, when we finally broke through and won the wild card. And uh, that was a celebration because we earned it. We were in first place most of the year and held on to the wild card at the end. Uh, but it was it was the first taste of winning. And one thing I can tell you about winning, and I know Tiger fans feel this way, is once you taste it once, you never want to not not have it on your you know kind of on your menu, so to speak. Yeah. And, and I, you're right. It took the pitching a minute to get going, but Keuchel had that transcendent year that first year he were there. Oh, yeah. yeah, he won the Cy Young. I mean, it, it, let me tell you something. It, it the players. You know, when they you get a performance like that, and then you get the the the, 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 the youthful enthusiasm that came through, and they all performed well. Like we again, like paralleling it to the Tigers, is the young talent can be good if they're good faster, then things move faster, right? Like we're seeing what Torque's doing, we're seeing what Riley's doing. It's the same thing that we were seeing in in Houston, and then we put together a full season, winning months, we put together winning stretches. Uh, won a ton of games and got into the wild card. We won the wild card game at Yankee Stadium, and that was sort of the birth of a team that started to believe they could win. Yeah, also the birth of a team that gave the Yankees a lot of nightmares over the next <laughs> next seven years or so in those in those postseasons. But um, was there a, through, during your time in Houston? Those were fun teams. They still are fun teams. But you had the privilege of managing you know, Hall of Fame caliber players at their peak. Uh, you know, in 2019, those years you got out of Verlander and Cole, you know, two guys with 200 innings, 300 strikeouts, I mean, on the same team, it's ridiculous. Do you manage greatness or great players differently? Do you give them a longer leash than you would a guy who's just maybe fighting for a roster spot? Um, it's another good question. I, I think it's both. I think, I think it's harder to manage, um, you know, the magnitude of, of certainly those two. I mean, JV and Cole are as prepared as any players I've ever been around. And they were still at peak performance. Um, you know, we, we, we acquired Zach Granke, another, you know, borderline Hall of Famer, and he he, he does it his own way. Um, you can, you know, there, there's, there's certainly interactions that, um, that with established guys, the respect they deserve, the interaction, but you have to take them out whenever they're tiring, just like anybody else. You have to give them extra rest like anybody else. Um, you have to explain to them a little less because they get it, they've been there, they've done that. Um, but that year in 19, like, I had reporters asking me, you know, off the record all the time, like, gosh, how, how do you separate these two? And I'm like, I don't have to for awards, you do. Like, I'm just gonna put them one and two in whatever series they fall in, in whatever order it, 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 it happens. And it just so happened that year, like Garrett Cole pitched game five against the Rays in the, in the ALDS, punched out like 15 or 16, which just springboarded JV to pitching, you know, kind of the brighter games in the ALCS and then they both pitch in the World Series. So um, I think you have to you have to you have to manage players where they're at, not where you want them to be. And so if it's an older if it's a player, some guys need more attention than others. And it doesn't really matter whether it's a young guy or an old guy or experienced or inexperienced. You have to you have to approach them in you know, in, in their moment, in their space, the way they like to be communicated with. And um, those are different guys, even though they're both tracking towards the hall of fame they're they have to be communicated with differently because of their personalities and the way they, they absorb information. For sure. Uh, let's skip ahead. Now you have the tenure in Houston, you let go in hindsight. Is there, I mean, I know it was obviously a whirlwind and you deal with the, the public scrutiny and the backlash and all that stuff, but was there any part of you that was, a little grateful you didn't have to deal with the headache that was the COVID year at all? <clears throat> uh, no, because I was so embarrassed by how everything went down. You know, I will forever um, apologize for that section of my career. I hope that the bulk of my career will will show 
my work and my worth and my in my you know my capabilities and i won't be defined by by that section um but i have to always apologize because we were wrong and so you know obviously that covid year was my suspension year mm -hmm. and and it's easy for people my friends my family like everybody has always said like oh man what a year to miss and i'm like yeah but that didn't come for free like that came with a with the very low moments of me realizing the magnitude of of what we did that was wrong and 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 it was going to be it was going to be forever tagging me. i mean i still hear from it i mean fans will yell things in, in opposing stadiums and and people will will say things without even knowing me um because of that and so you know yes did i did i reconnect with my family i hunkered down with my family my girls were both home from school um we had them, I mean, in order to, and that was more or less about COVID and more about just getting myself back um, in the public eye and facing, you know, sort of the backlash of getting back into managing. That was important for me. Like, I will stand up for myself. You do that, you know, you make mistakes. Um, would I do things differently? Of course I would. Um, is, is it, is it going to define me? Like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to, going to do my part to make this a winning franchise and hopefully deliver a world series title to Detroit. And that motivation, you know, stems from that COVID year where I was banned from baseball. I was out of the game that I have been a part of for 25 years at the highest level. Um, and that, you know, that fueled me when teams started calling me at the end of that, that, that COVID year, um, it gave me hope that I was going to get to do this again. Was there any concern following what happened that you might not get calls? I mean, I know you said the Tigers sure. were the first to give you a rank. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Because you just don't know, you know, how, um, you know, how it's going to go. Like it, you know, when I, when I flew to, to New York and I, um, and I got, you know, spoken to by the league and by the commissioner, um, that's not like a, a game. Like that's not like, you know, just just sort of a side coffee conversation, you know, like that was very serious. And so um, I, you know, I was I was worried about everything. I mean, obviously, I was going to do something in life. I mean, I, I had, you know, things that were starting to line up where I could go and, and be a positive part of the, of, of the world again. I didn't know if it was going to be a manager until, you know, both the White Sox and the Tigers called and, and expressed interest. Uh, and now you've been here. This is your fourth time flies, man. It feels like a lot has changed. We've gone through the pandemic. We've now gone through multiple regimes of Tiger baseball uh, with you at the helm. You know, now that this is this is Harris's second full year in charge. The question I've asked everybody that's been on the show so far from the organization. What are the differences that you've noticed between the Al Avila era versus what Scott Harris and his regime has brought to the table? Yeah. So whenever things happen, like, you know, I've been a part of a couple of different regime changes at a couple of different times. And some of it's been on the backside of it. And, and this one, you know, I was here in this role on the front end side of it. So it, it's always a combination. Like there are players from, you know, they're blending now from from both, you know, front offices. There are, um, you know, there's there's the pros and cons of all of that. There's there's philosophy changes. There's. I think the biggest, I mean, our pitching development and our player development um, with Scott is is churning, you know, and, and it, it's, you know, there's a, I mean, listen, Al was here when we brought in Chris Fetter. Chris Fetter came when I came. Uh, we've enhanced that with Robin Lund. Juan Nieves was in the system. We brought him up from the minor leagues. Gabe Rebus was brought in um, in, the, in, the, in the minor league pitch development. Ryan Garko, um, whose, whose role in this organization cannot be, um, you know, overstated. He's a huge part of what we're doing um, in development in the minor leagues that's transitioning to the big leagues. So, you know, there's everybody wants to pinpoint the one thing, but it's whether it's in scouting and development, like there's all sorts of ingredients that are combined and, and the, the processes that are in place now, the communication that's in place now is really exceptional. And I think there's alignment and we hear that word all the time. It's a big fancy word that that people like to say as a catchphrase when it's, when you actually do it, it's pretty awesome. When you, you have, you know, acquiring talent, getting utilized, getting developed, getting used in the big leagues, and we're all turning in, in at, at, at optimal speed, then things can turn fast. And so I, I appreciate being brought here, 
you know, by Chris Illich and Al Avila. And then when Scott Harris and Jeff Greenberg extended me and wanted to partner up, you know, for the, for the future, um, I feel like I got a, a, another boost of energy and adrenaline because even though it's my fourth year, it still feels like my second because like, yeah. things had changed, you know, two years ago when Scott got here. Yeah, uh, understandable. And, and I think that one thing I've realized talking to some guys within the organization is they've done a great job of realizing there's not necessarily a one size fits all approach when it comes to player development. The guys uh, look at analytics differently, guys look at video differently, guys look at the numbers differently. And I think kind of figuring out what respective process works for each guy is is very important. You brought him up earlier. Um, a big fan of, of Chris Fetter. Just curious, uh, where how did your relationship with him begin? So Fett and I had known each other a long time. He was a player with the Padres um, in double A when I was assistant GM there. And so, and, you know, part of the job of, of farm directors and assistant GMs and, and any front office, man, they're going to tour the Meyer leagues and get to know the personnel. And so um, Randy Smith, who was a former GM of the Tigers, was our farm director at the time. And told me that, you know, he's like, hey, man, you should go to double A and you should grab Chris Fetter and and get to know him a little bit. He was a, you know, kind of a um, injury prone kind of pitcher in our system who was probably going to transition to to post playing jobs. And so we're always trying to grab players who have a future in something else and and see what they're all about. So I met up with Fett and developed a relationship with them and ended up hiring them on my pro scouting staff, sent them to send him to scout school and just showed them sort of the behind the scenes, how, how scouting reports are built and how uh, player and player uh, acquisitions happen and player development. And that spring, he springboarded to, to many things, right? He was a pitching coordinator with the Dodgers. He went to ball state. He ended up back at Michigan. I tried to hire him in Houston when things started to change there and our pitching department opened up, he wouldn't leave. Um, and I always told myself if I got another opportunity. He was like a guy that had circled and we'd kept a relationship throughout the years. And when I got the Detroit job, he was the first call. Um, and I was like, Hey, listen, I've always wanted you to come to this level. I don't even need you to go very far. Like just come over from Ann Arbor and, and you'll be the pitching coach. And, and he took the job and he, he is my right hand man when it comes to this, the pitching side. And, um, he's a trusted guy, and, 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 but he's a, he's a tireless worker. And um, when you see the relationship building that he has with the pitchers and the trust that, that you know, somebody like Tarek Skubal is going to pitch opening day, he's had, he's had Skubal now for a few years. And, and him developing into this, you know, beast of a pitcher is, is not by accident. It's a work by the player. You know, the, the coaches, we're here to, to sort of accelerate it. Um, but all of our pitchers are better that they get to work with Fed. Yeah, no, I I agree, and I mean he he'd probably be too humble to admit it, but there is you know seeing the stuff these guys are featuring in spring, you know, with Flaherty all of a sudden hitting ninety seven and Mize you know pumping back to ninety eight with good off speed stuff. I mean, there's a correlation there, and, and it goes back to the you know the bullpen, the work you've gotten out of the bullpen, even the starters the last several years, even with the injuries you've had. I wanted to talk about the bullpen because you know I've always praised the way that you manage your pen and the way that you kind of are a believer in fluid bullpen roles and leverage being more important than the inning. Uh, and that you know, having a closer, but not necessarily having to use that, saving that closer for the ninth inning. Uh, has your philosophy on that changed since you became a manager, or is that one that you've always maintained going back to Arizona? Yeah, so bullpen management is a huge part of my job. Yeah. Um, and, and part of that is like you're, you're talking about usage. I think it's probably 50 50 communication and usage, like to get these guys to understand how they're going to be used and what that's going to be expected from them and them develop kind of a team within a team. And that's where Juan and Robin and Fett come in to, to sort of pick up the pieces when that system breaks down or, you know, I, I don't use somebody in a situation or I, you know, I use somebody different. So my philosophy has always been um, you want the pitchers who have the best chance of getting the outs in that moment. And, and where you get better with experience is you get better at reading those situations of knowing when you're going to need swing and miss. Like that's where Alex Lang comes in, knowing where you need a you need a right hander with power stuff that can get the ball on the ground who can also miss bats. But like contact's going to be on the ground. That's Jason Foley. You see a quick arm with Will Vest and like he goes top rail quite a bit and you see a pocket of the of the line. You've done your homework and you see where that top rail is open here comes Will Vest, or you get Tyler Holton 
You know, you're like, hey, listen, they're that manager is going to pinch hit a righty, and he actually has the backdoor cutter, the indoor cutter. He's got to change up. He can drop a curveball in, like five, six shapes of pitches. Like that guy can be utilized because I know what that other manager is going to be doing. So there's there's an art to the to the usefulness of the, but there's a buy-in that needs to happen that you need a whole bunch of people to help with in order to do it. It doesn't always work out perfectly. You don't always have the personnel set up to do it that way. I'm not afraid of the closer. You want to roll one of these beasts out at the back end of the game. I'm all in on, on, I had it um, with Presley in, in, um, in Houston. So I'm not afraid of the term, but the reason I don't use the term in public a lot is I need the buy-in from the players that that you might save the game in the seventh inning by coming in and punching out somebody, or I might need you with against Jose Ramirez in Cleveland in the eighth inning, ninth inning be damned, right? Like it, 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 I can lose the game in the eighth with somebody different and just leave this back end guy in the pen that could have got the swing and miss like shame on me. And so I, I think our, you know, that has only strengthened with how this, this bullpen has been built over the last couple of years. And it's, it's turned into a major strength and, and to go on to a different tangent, the reason it's a major strength is a, I can count on the players to come in and throw strikes. Um, B I can, they know that their best stuff is what I'm after when they come in. Like I'm not asking Jason Foley to come in and throw a secondary pitch. I want power. I want the ball on the ground. I'm not asking, you know, somebody to, to do something that they can't do. And, and hopefully if we've done our jobs right, we've we've talked to them about here's the pocket where I see we're about to go face the White Sox. Here's this pocket. When it starts with Luis Robert, it's you, you, and you. When it starts with Gavin Sheets, you know it's going to be Holton or Chafin. And that might be in the fifth inning with the bases loaded. It might be in the sixth. It might be in the eighth. It's a little hard to predict at 2 o'clock when that's going to happen. But hopefully over time I've earned their, their trust that I – that I'm going to put them in a good spot to be successful. Yeah, and I really like the outlook of the bullpen this year. I, I think that even near the end of last year, I know like guys like Cisnero had their struggles and Lang had his struggles the last few months, but as a whole, I like the back end. Holton had a great year. Did you kind of identify after going out and getting Shelby Miller and, and, and Chafin, uh, did you kind of identify that as potentially being a strength of this team coming into the year? Yeah, so I, I think this. There, I think there's eight, you know, we're starting the season with eight. I think pitchers nine, 10, 11, and 12 that are in, in, that are going to be in Toledo yeah. are going to, are going to impact us. And so I think what we have is we have versatility. We have guys that can go multiple one ups, two ups, even three times, um, you know, three innings. That's a huge advantage. Whenever somebody runs a pitch count high, or you have some guys coming in, you know, like Casey's coming off an injury or you have, um, you know, Maeda who uses a lot of pitch equity, in his games and ends up coming out in the fifth or sixth inning most of the time. Um, there's other days where I'm going to be able to give him rest because guys go seven, eight, maybe even nine innings. So the fact that we're versatile in the pen and we throw strikes, we have a pretty good balance left and right that I have a, I have a path to, to different style games. Um, there's a reason last year we were, we were great in bullpen games. And I know yeah. that's not traditionally something that people like, um, but it's pretty effective. And so when you can mix and match against the opponent and, and they see somebody different, that's pretty good. So when I, when I look at our pen, I see that I, that I, whatever we determine that we need against this particular part of the lineup, I feel like we have it. And I feel like we have a plan B and that's a good feeling. I mean, it's not going to go perfect. Like there's nothing worse than you have a plan you target a guy, you walk out there, you put the ball in his hand, and then he rifles a base hit or he hits a homer. Yeah. Like the feeling that you feel as a fan is the same thing that we feel in the dugout, but it wasn't done, um, you know, haphazardly. It was done with a with a clear reason why we were trying to do it. It's just the competition that beat us. And it, and if you if you get the buy in from the player, which we do, and you get the work done to sharpen whatever weapons those guys have, that's where the pitching department comes in. You can have a dynamic pen and a very unpredictable one for the other manager to have to deal with. Yeah. And it's always, it's so easy. And I'm, I'm as guilty of this as anybody to, to Monday morning quarterback decisions when it comes to pitching changes. But my whole philosophy is kind of what you said, which is if it doesn't work, it's one thing, but if the move makes sense and it doesn't work, there's kind of nothing, you know, you can do about it. the players still have to execute. You alluded a bit to the, the depth in that bullpen. I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about the depth 
uh, within the organization because the news – some people were surprised by it. I was a bit surprised by it that Manning will be starting the year uh, in, in AAA. I, I guess I, I view that as good news. That's not a slight against Manning, but I know he's a major league pitcher, and he's a major league pitcher who's going to see starts at some point this year. I feel that way about Sawyer Gibson Long as well. Do you feel like that's been one of the better parts of the last few years – is the way that the organization has added pitching depth, especially considering the bad luck you guys have had with injuries over the last few years? Yeah, so they're very I mean, injuries are unpredictable, and it's it's hard when they come up. and And one thing that I know we all will agree on is we want to have somebody that starts the game um, that gives you a chance, mm -hmm. right? And he's somebody that can get some swing and miss, can get some soft contact, can get you into the middle part of the game, and so that you have that path to a win. Whenever that happens now, every team, good, mediocre or bad, will use in excess of eight or nine, 10 starting pitchers to start games. Now, take away the opener, take away sort of randomness, but actual like World Series caliber teams use nine and 10 starters per season. But yet we obsess over this five or six that we have to worry about in the spring. And we and life is over if we have to if we have somebody out. Totally get it. Like I. I fell for Matt Manning. I mean, that conversation kept me and Fett up all night. Like we we were not looking forward to it. He had done nothing wrong. Like, like two things can coexist. One, you can get a hell of a lot better and have done all your work. And two, lose out on a competition because we have choices. It's not going to make you feel better if you're Matt Manning, but but that is organizational health, that is organizational depth, that is going to mean that we can be strategic giving extra rest and pulling somebody up from the minor leagues, whether it's Manning, whether it's Sawyer Gibson Long, whether it's Cater Mar Ma uh, Montero, you know, whether it's, you know, Brant Herter, who we gave an extended look at in spring training, like we can go six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10 and feel pretty good about it that we're, that we're going to get a, a quality start. It's not perfect because we are getting better. We said at the beginning of camp, we're going to be a harder, harder team to make. Um, and I say that on purpose because that is a good sign. It's it's sleepless nights at the end of camp. It's sort of indigestion when you have to deliver that news. Um, but the overall health in, of our competitiveness is in a good place. And that development needs to continue because that competition still continues. I don't want our guys to necessarily think they're pitching for their jobs every five days or every outing. Um, but it is good to know that if there, if there starts to be a decline in performance, we should have, you know, very reputable, very ready, um, very quality major league players that are that are waiting for their opportunity. Yeah. And it's that whole idea of we focus on those five or six that are you know going to leave camp. It's kind of an old I'm not going to call it old fashioned just because I think it's more human nature. But that is something that back in the day, like you did use five or six throughout a season. You know, I mean, not 2013 Tigers use six stars all year. And it's like if that with the the games changing and injuries becoming more prevalent, you kind of have to go. I mean, look what happened to, to the Rays last year. Or what happens to the Dodgers? You have to go nine, ten deep sometimes with your starters. Uh, there's a few individual players I wanted to ask about just with their situation. So I wanted to start with Spencer Torkelson and just kind of he's had a lot of peaks and valleys for somebody who's so young into his uh, career. I guess were you to start, were you surprised by how much he struggled in the first you know year and a half of his you know pro career? Um, not really, because I, I thought his process um, needed some refinement, his his setup, his consistency in his work. You know, we wanted to we want to make sure that the work he's doing in the training room molds into what he's doing in the weight room, which molds into what he's doing in the cage, which comes into the game. Like there's a system that players need to get comfortable with to play at this level every day. Right. He had missed some time during um, his amateur days through the COVID stuff. He gets drafted one one. We all know what that means that, you know, he kind of rifles through the minors, put up solid numbers, not spectacular numbers. And he gets to the big leagues and, and we thrust a lot of attention towards him. Um, that's a lot for him. And the youthfulness came through with just inconsistencies. And so what he's a great example of is the development time that's needed, both at the minor league level and the major league level to establish yourself. Right. I know we're in this generation where we want things done like right now, like we want to label him. What is he? We want to see what what. You know, this is the player he's going to be. We want to identify it and guess right now so that we can either think we were right or try to prove ourselves right later as a whole, as a, as a sort of generation. 
Um, it's just not the way that development at the major league level happens. Like sometimes they go off right away and they're good. Um, they'll probably have a, a like sort of regression at some point that we we sort of cast off because they gave us a good first impression. And others, it takes a little bit of a choppier road and then they spike. And that that's what last year was for Torque. Um, then he comes this spring and he has a little bit of a rough spring. And now there's, you know, all sorts of questions about him. Um, what's unwavered is my confidence in him or his confidence in himself. And he's going to hit in the middle of the order opening day because he can do a ton of damage. He's got a good process. He, he knows he can play at this level and he's maturing. Like he's also like super young in yeah. life, right? He just got engaged. He's just building his family. He's, he's, he doesn't have to carry the weight of the, of the Detroit Tigers on his back, um, despite many people trying to throw it on him. We got to surround him with, with good people. You don't just fall out of bed and hit 30 homers. And you also don't, um, you know, you, 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 you're going to be pitched differently now that he has. And I think that adjustments are going to be made, and, and he's a really good player. He's got a really good head on his shoulders, and um, he's, going to be a, he's going to be a really good player consistently you know, if we just let him grow up. Yeah, and it was it was obviously frustrating that first year and a half, but what was so – you always knew the intangibles were there, and, and I wondered if, if to a certain extent it got in his head because there were just these, these things like struggling on fastballs down the middle type of thing. It's like, I know he can hit that pitch. You know, like, I think that it just – it was that adjustment uh, period that took him a while and hopefully he takes off uh, this year. You know, one situation that I, I, I want to talk about this delicately because it is – you know, it was a delicate thing, but I, I'm just curious – the Austin Meadows scenario or situation, what happened there? And, and obviously he asked for privacy. And so I don't want to, you know, you know, try to pry open anything in his personal life. I'm just curious as, as his manager, did you get any closure on that situation and kind of where he's at right now? Or has there been kind of a, a separation at this point? Well, we have Parker. And so we have the family in our family still, and we'll, we'll forever, you know, root for Austin to just be better for himself, for his life, for his child, you know, his, um, I know he interacted with some of our guys during camp. He lives in the, in the St. Pete Tampa area. Um, so some off days, some guys got to see him and he's incrementally getting better from what I understand, but he is the definition of these guys are people first player yeah. second, you know, we can evaluate the player all we want, what we did get, what we didn't get. And I think that's fair game, but none of it matters if we, if the person isn't right. And so when he came to me um, originally and opened up to me about what he was struggling with and how, how it was impacting him, the moments that we had away from the field, it was either in my office or in the trainer's room or even off campus, um, you know, that mattered to me that he trusted me enough to, to confide in me. And then all that mattered from that point forward was um, him dealing with the anxiety. So he's done the work and he's, he's getting his life in order. Um, and it, it's, it's no fault of his own. Like this is not something that he neglected. It's not something that he could control. Um, it's actually an issue that that's medical that he has to deal with um, day to day. So um, I love the man. I think he, he was super honest with us about where he was at. Um, you know, we try not to, to, to put that on Parker, as an example, right. like our conversations with Parker are not about Austin other than checking in on him, you know, guys, his brother. But, um, you know, from my understanding, Austin's not playing um, and doesn't plan to right now. And and he's just continuing to work on his mental health and and support his brother. I, I know they had a nasty golf match in the spring and and I believe Parker won, which was a big deal um, in the Meadows family. And and he's doing his best to, to support Parker as a big brother. Does it make you feel good about the culture of the organization that you have multiple players? I guess you could probably throw Erod in there as well, who've been willing to open up about some of the things that they've struggled with. Yeah, I love our I love our staff. Um, you know, that gets to know these guys and um, trainers, strength. You know, positional coaches. Me as a manager, we have a ton of resources around. One thing that Scott has brought um, that is unique is is a ton of resources to, for the players. That's confidential. Uh, we provide a lot of, a lot of support, you know, in the organization, but also outside the organization for these guys to, to be able to turn to whether it's, you know, personal and in their family life or whether it's professional with dealing with, 
you know, being on the borderline of being sent down to struggling to um, even how to deal with all the attention. I mean, these guys, especially with the evolution of social media, like there's no break. Like there's no time in which these guys are not featured as Detroit Tigers players. And that that comes with its own set of pressures. So um, we want our players to be open. We want them to know they have resources to get help um, or just somebody to talk to that's not affiliated with their playing time or affiliated with their pitch development or affiliated with with their swing mechanics. Um, if they're comfortable with those guys, cool, we're here for you. If not, then we, you know, we want you to, to get yourself well. For sure. And the next player I wanted to ask about, and I, uh, he's been a topic of, of much of my content is, is Javier Baez. And, and I look, you see what we see like on, on the field, you, you, you see the struggles and, and he does as well. Uh, so like I, it's it'd be stupid to ask you know to for criticism. I'm just curious, how do you deal? How have you dealt with a player that you know is not only struggling on the field but going through a lot of s- scrutiny off the field, given the contract, given the expectations? How have you handled his struggles over these last two years? Yeah, I mean we've you know we've talked a ton. I went to Puerto Rico um, and saw him and and just hung out in his space and. To get to know, you know, where he's come from, what his family's like, where, you know, where his head's at. And he's got a great support system around him. And what I've tried to do with Javi is, is try to convince him that he doesn't have to replicate El Mago in Chicago. Mm-hmm. Like, I know all of us look at the back of the baseball card and we look at the, at the, the numbers and we look at the war and we, and, and we hold him accountable to those numbers to do right now. And when he falls short, there's a massive reaction. And so I'm trying to separate him from that and just get him to be the best version and whatever he can contribute. Um, So that's why I've I've fired up about his defense. You know, he made a throwing error the other day, the first one in spring. And, you know, I didn't even really react because it was like the first one in 20 plus games that he's, that he's played. Um, and I know there's great expectations. I'm like the contract I stay far away from. Like, I don't, I, you know, I want these guys to make a ton of money. I want them to get their lifetime security, but I don't, I don't play that game to, 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 you know, to, to talk about it with the players. Yeah. Uh, I want to make sure their routine is good. I want to make sure like he was awesome with Joey Cora this spring in coming to the field and doing his, his, his defensive routine. That, that can't be, um, overlooked because like his defense in the spring was the best it's been in the years that he's been a tiger, you know, offensively, I do like where he was trending towards the end of camp where the recognition was getting a tick better, but he's going to swing and miss and he's going to chase. And, and the thing about hobby, we know it, the reaction is going to be pretty massive because of the struggles that he's had the last couple of years. My job as his manager is to shield all that stuff away from him and just get him to do four bats and get him to do what he can do tonight. He can be a game changer. And if he gets a game changer, it's going to get a reaction one, one, you know, if he has a good game, it's going to get a reaction one way or the other. When he has a bad reaction, I mean, a bad game, we know what the reaction is going to be. I'm just trying to shield him from all of that. I have his back. I know, I know he's got to be better for us to be better. I, what I'm doing is I've moved him down the order. You know, he's not in a feature spot anymore. Um, I'm going to try to keep them rested to see if that's going to help. Maybe there's a game off or two, um, or maybe things click for him and we start seeing the flashes of, of good, of good that he's done in the last couple of years. Like we're humans too. So we, we often dwell on the things that we want to look at. And with him, you know, he's been a, he's, he's, he's had his struggles and he knows it. And I think, you know, he's done the work, he's addressing it. He's openly talking about it. It's not, he's not dismissive. He's not moody. He's not, someone who doesn't take accountability behind closed doors. Um, he's, he's just a private guy on the field. And that's why you don't see all the, um, the reactions he's, that, that, that necessarily you want to see. Um, it's, it's different behind the scenes when you see him work. Mm-hmm. That's fair. Yeah. And, and, and understandable. What's always been tough with hobby is even though it's been a few years, like I know the physical gifts are there. You know, I watched him in the WBC. It was great. Like it, it's just that the consistency and you'll see him like, after the bases running error last year, he had about a two week stretch where he was really solid. Um, a few, a few more. Uh, if you if you got the time here, that sure. I want to want to ask. Uh, friend of the program, a guy that we've interviewed, Jackson Job, came in in spring a few weeks ago, threw the greatest inning I've ever seen. I mean, I'm I'm only slightly exaggerating with that with the the stuff he was featuring. Um, that was his spring training debut. 
Was your plan to always use him in the ninth inning of a game? Um, a little bit, not, not for the reasons that it probably people think, um, not for like the back end of a game. It just was the way the game evolved. Like we, we had some guys pitching that game that were competing for jobs. You tend to pitch them in the middle part of the game. And so Jackson was going to pitch. The question was one or two innings. And then we decided one, and then he started getting pushed to the back of the line. So it was more back of the line than it was ninth inning. Okay, yeah, I was wondering about that because it ended it ended up being a save situation. I mean, obviously, <laughs> but, yeah, which uh, is one for one. <laughs> I know, that's the thing. Um, and I guess uh, talking about just the overall, you know, you got him, you got Ty Madden, you got Wilmer Flores that are coming up. And you, when you came here, there was kind of the other big three of Mize and Manning and Skugel. Uh, do you feel like the pitching development and, and getting the most out of these guys is just in a better place than it was maybe when you arrived here? Yeah, it is because I think, I think one, I think we as a group, have done a great job of individualizing that development. Like Jackson Job um, came to, you know, when he, when he was drafted, he elite fastball, elite spin um, and, and pretty good strike thrower. But, uh, but let's be honest, a high school strike thrower. Now he comes into pro ball and then there's like elite fastball, pretty good spin. I mean, great spin, but like trying to find his way on what shape the breaking ball is going to go um, can make the ball move an incredible strike thrower at, at the minor league level. Now we're getting into like more specific with him where it's, we need the great fastball. We need the elite spin. We need you to not have any sort of um, bad reps and bad reps is going to be like count management. Like we're not going to throw all two old fastballs because when you get to the big leagues, like there's Jose Ramirez waiting for you. There's Luis Robert waiting for you. There's, you know, Carlos Correa and Royce Lewis waiting for you in Minnesota. And there is Juan Soto waiting in New York. Like, it's just different, right? So we're going to have to learn how to use our stuff a little bit better. And so that's individual for him. Ty Madden, very different, right? Ty Madden comes from a college program, pretty polished. Now he's working on left-handed hitters. He's trying to find some weapons. So that to be a starter in the big leagues, you've got to impact righties and lefties. Because guys like me on the other side are just stacking the lineup against your weakness, in trying to trying to give you a hard time to get through the order. So Ty Madden's a little bit different. Um, Wilbur Flores, obviously huge extension, really good breaking ball. Velo off the charts this spring. Um, we're going to shorten him up a little bit and, and try to get him into three inning stints and pitch him more often and see if he can be used. He's on the 40 man now. So his timeline is like fast forwarded because he's on his first option and you only have three option years until you need to know what he is. So there, I think this development, be, the fact that we can individualize it um, and maximize strengths if we need things to something that somebody needs to work on a little bit more. For Ty, it's the lefties. For Jackson, it's quality strikes as opposed to general strikes. For Ty, I mean, for Wilmer, it's how to incorporate his spin into this, into his game more, more often. Um, that's where we're getting really good. And then there are, a ton of other names that, you know, whether it's Melton in, in, in the minors or whether it's um, what Jason Foley's doing to combat the, the left-handedness of the guys that they're pinch hitting against. That's where the value of Robin and, and, and Juan and Fett and Gabe and Stefanos um, that are, that are really doing a ton of work because pitching is the one area where we can control a variable. Like we can, we can change a pitch grip. We can change the usage pattern. We can change a location. And it, and it impacts the hitter so much faster than the reactionary side of the sport, which is the offense. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. No, completely. And I think the thing you bring up with Job about making sure it's quality strikes, you know, in certain counts, I think that's something. And when we talked to him, he said this as well, that Scoople struggled with a little bit in the early part of his career where, you know, in the minors, he was 70 percent heater, you know, and it's like you you get to the big leagues, no matter how good that fastball is, you're going to have to make that adjustment. You're going to have to mix in off speed on 2-0, 3-1. Uh, and I wanted to ask about about school. You obviously named him opening day starter. Uh, it just feels watching him in spring and even the latter part of last season, the growth is apparent from what we've seen from the young guy that we saw in the in the COVID year. What and you arrived here in twenty one. What's the biggest difference that you've noticed in him since you became his manager in, in twenty one? I think um, I think Fett has done a really good job of getting him to control his delivery. You know, he's a big physical guy. He is, he's got, you know, his body was growing while he's, and he's trying to learn how to maximize his leverage. 
Um, the leg kick is huge, the landing spot. And then his arm was so fast, he had a hard time. He would spray the ball all over the place. Yeah. And he's still going to spray it a little bit. But if you look at his miss patterns over the last couple of years, you're going to see him shrink more and more. And now he's starting to incorporate like this change up. You know, when he came, when he first got him, he had a little bit of a split. He was having a hard time pronating. And Fett's done a really good job of getting his pitch mix simplified, getting his delivery simplified, and getting his energy down the hill. And now that that has turned him into a very good strike thrower and and very good at pitching it all four quadrants of the strike zone. It's not just high heaters, low off speed. He can throw low bullets. You know, he can throw backdoor spin. He can throw a changeup at any point and feel really good about it. And they're all stacking lineups against him with righties, which makes that that attack plan something that he can do, you know, do wonders with. So his as he shrunk down his misses, his reliability of, of being able to get into counts has been great. As he gets into counts, what did he do all last summer is he punched guys out like crazy. Yeah. Um, that's not by accident. So I, you know, it's it's the evolution of a lot of different things, not just, oh, he just had to pitch more and get more experience. Like, no, that's not it. He had to redefine a few things and, and tweak this and tweak that. And all of a sudden, um, when things have clicked, he's he's become a beast. And when, you know, when I named him opening day starter, I did it in front of the whole team because everybody watched this evolve. You know, outside of a couple of guys, Kenta wasn't here, Kano wasn't here. But we won't watch this. We watched him rehab in Detroit last year. We watched him come out last, you know, last year. And even though he'd want to bite my head off every time I take him out of the game, we watched him come back from injury and just compete his tail off. Mm -hmm. And so when I said it in front of the team and the whole, the whole room was all pumped up and he was getting emotional and they're like speech, speech, and he couldn't even talk, you know, like that's galvanizing as a team that I, you know, I, I don't want him to take opening day any differently, but I wanted him to take the message that you matter on this team way more than you give yourself credit. And, and the players responded perfectly. And, and now we're going to hand them the ball. And it might go well, it might not, but every single player that shows up in Chicago on opening day thinks we have the best chance to win because Tarek Skubal's pitching. Absolutely. And there is, look, opening day is always great, but there is something a little bit cooler about it just as a fan when it is a homegrown guy. I mean, this is the first Tigers draft pick who started opening day since Verlander. I mean, that's that's pretty, pretty you know, remarkable. Pretty good company, too. I mean, that, that's yeah. amazing. I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out because um, there are a lot of people that 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 touch this guy's career to get to this point. And mm -hmm. we hope this is just the beginning. Like, I don't want this to be his story that he got to be named opening day and then. Right. And then he disappears. I hope this is I hope this is an assignment we give him, you know, many years ahead. For sure. You uh you signed an extension in the offseason, uh, which I appreciate because now I, I don't have to get asked every day on Twitter if you're ever gonna leave, which so thank you. Um I'm I'm sure you were getting tired of it as well. You know, I, um, I don't you know, let me let me just make one comment on that before you question I, Yeah. I, I really love it here and I, I love yeah. the fact of what we're building and I never understood that question. Our media would ask me all the time you know, about opt outs and if this was springboarding. And I don't know if it's because of when I came and how the transition was going that, that you know, coming out of my suspension and 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 obviously the Tigers, mm -hmm. we've been trying to 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 steer this ship in a better direction. Um, but I, I did I'm super proud that that Scott wanted to talk to me right after the season. It was the day after it was an immediate yes. Um, and I and I and I can't wait to have a winning season and build this thing the right way. The 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 fact that it's been a, a conversation um, has and more frustrated me because like, you know, my, guys in my job, like <laughs> most of the time they're not talking about leaving. They're talking about getting rid of you. Right. We're managers. Like, <laughs> yeah, we, fair we, point. We're, yeah. we're told to go away way more than we just decide, oh, you know, what? I don't want to be here. I want to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But but the Illich family, the Scott, um, you know, it was a no brainer. Like We are heading in the right direction and I want to I want to be a part of it. And, and I, I think that was. Those theories, it was two things. One was just the shelf life with Dusty in Houston. How long was he going to last? And people were trying to fit with that timeline if he leaves. And the second one, I think, was that Alex Cora got rehired by the Red Sox right after his suspension year. Uh, so I think that there was some fear that that was going to happen. I know, Yeah, I always just said he's, he's here right now. I'm glad he's here as a manager. Um, but what what have you seen over the last, you know, really the last three years, but especially the last calendar year or so, that makes you believe that this is now sustainable and something that can become a consistent winner again? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think there's a couple things. One is 
the message from from above me has been very consistent from the get go. From Chris Illich when I sat down and had dinner with him, uh, to Scott when he got hired and he and he and he shared what his vision was. And I didn't take lightly that I was an inherited manager with Scott. Like Scott, you know, it is is incredible to work for, but he's also somebody who has a definite plan and 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 has a definite um, expectation on how. Um, how to do it right and how to how to build this the right way and what's going to be expected for development at the minor leagues, development at the big leagues. We're going to find every advantage we can. And, and that partnership is a super important partnership when it comes to winning franchises. Um, and I take that lightly. And I, and I love the development of the players. Like I, I said when I first got this job, why I take this job with the Tigers is because of the players. And that was Riley Green in the minor leagues at the time. That was Spencer Torkelson at the time. Um, that was what, what I felt like could be a core of a team that's, you know, Scooble, Manning, Mize um, was was starting to scratch the surface in the big leagues. Um, and that development and their development and is has continued. You know, there's been a rash of injuries on the pitching side that, um, you know, has been unfortunate, but they're coming out of it extremely well. Scooble's been very dominant. Casey's been incredible this spring. Look Matt Manning was incredible this spring, even though he didn't make our team. And then you see little pieces that are starting to come together. And I know the commitment's going to be there to press go. Cole Keith coming up. Cole was in the A ball when I got here. Um, and now he's, you know, a center part of our team. So the 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 work that's being done behind the scenes, the it's starting to show up in the big leagues. I love the way we finished last year. It we need we need to do that for a full season and to have a winning season. You have a winning season, then you have a chance to, to, to win as many games as you can and get to the playoffs. The fact that that's starting to turn um, is why I'm so you know optimistic and happy and proud to be a Tiger. Appreciate it. Yeah. And look, we're, we're obviously excited to, to have you back. It was a relief to see that you, that you had signed an extension. I said at the time, it's, it's great not just to have you back, but you wouldn't have resigned if you didn't believe that there was a pathway to you know, no. long-term uh, success here. Last question. I'm always, I always ask something like this to my guests. Um, do you think that you're a good manager? Oof. Um, yeah. I, mean, I think I'm a good manager, and I think there are, are tons of times where I ask myself, like, why the heck did you do that? <laughs> or why did you? why are you obsessed with this or that? I mean, I have checkpoints along the way. I don't think I have all the answers ever, but I think I will – I, I will I will look for them. I will try my best to, to be I've always said I want to manage the perfect game, but um, I have a lot of confidence in 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 what I can do. I have a lot of a confidence in what I push my staff to do and ultimately push the players to do. And so um, I show up every day feeling like that I can do my part and then I go home on the days where you know I don't and I'm like, you know I kick I kick myself, I don't sleep and I I try to do better the next day. So I, uh, I don't know that you can have this position without uh, believing that you can press a, a, the right buttons or you can get the most out of a player or you can, you can push a player to be better, the best version of themselves. Um, they should get somebody else if you ever feel like you're not the best person. Sure. Well, I mean, we're excited about it. It's been, we're ready. I mean, we, 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 we're happy to have you here. Uh, we want to believe that this team is the one that's different. I love what we saw in spring and uh, I genuinely, even beyond that, just thanks for doing the show. Thanks for taking the time and uh, best luck this year and going forward. Like we uh, it, it's, it's time. We, we can't, we Absolutely. can't wait to see a winner here. Yeah. No, I appreciate you having me. And I know the fans, um, you know, you're going to like, you're going to like this team. You're going to like the team that, that you deserve it. I mean, I, I've every person I've ever worked that's ever worked in Detroit or ever played in Detroit or when it's been good knows, um, you know what a special place this can be when you when you earn the the fans to come out and and support you. And I know that I know Tiger fans are ready for a winning team for sure. Well, thank you, AJ. I appreciate you coming on. You got it. Thank you. Thank you so much to AJ. Uh, yeah, that felt good. That felt good. Um, I, I felt like I was prepared. He gave. He's he's just a sharp guy, man. What a smart baseball mind. And it's it's great. He's he's made me look good because I championed the hire when it happened. Uh, and I think he's done a wonderful job. And I. Just listening to him, and I'm I'm the lunatic who watches every AJ Hinge post game press conference. I really do think he believes in this team. I think that he he definitely sees a pathway, not just for this year's team, but in the the long term outlook 
of the organization that really, really excites me. So that was very, very kind of him to do. I want to have him on the show at some point again uh, in the future. Don't want to press my luck too much, but that really did feel good. So uh, that will do it for today's show. But uh, for people listening, obviously the I've begun so, sort of a new chapter in my life. I don't want to repackage or any or dig up any of the stuff we've talked about in the past. I've said my piece, thankful for Barstool, you know, grateful for my time there. But people have wondered what content will look like going forward. And uh, I've talked with Austin a bit. Chris and company will continue. Chris and company will likely continue just one day a week for the foreseeable future. And the reason for that is not to cut down on content, but to actually add to content. I want I want to make this a Chris Castellani network that features multiple shows. And the idea of doing two shows a week was always going to be a tough ask anyway, but I felt like, you know, while I was still at Barstool, I really wanted to pump those out and get the best guests that I could. But I wanted to branch out, do some different things that maybe uh, maybe I, I wanted to do at Barstool and just didn't have the confidence in. I, I'm not really sure, but I, I've talked with Austin. He's been working his butt off. Uh, these things will come. We're just hitting the baseball season. So we're going to, we're going to see things, you know, kind of come to fruition. We're going to get the ball rolling a little bit here. You know, my best stuff comes during baseball season. So I look forward to putting out more content, but for the time being, I feel good about this content. I feel really good about Chris and company. And I feel really good about you, all of you guys who continue to listen, share, like retweet. And that's what you can do. Subscribe to this channel. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Let's get those watch hours up. And uh, if all Chris and company content, the link to that can be found in the description for this video. Uh, next interview, I don't know who it'll be, but it'll be post Tigers opening day. So to everyone out there, uh, let the games begin. Enjoy the season. And again, thank you to AJ for coming on Chris and company. I'll see you later.